Hi, we're back with All Quiet on the Western Front, Chapter 7. Chapter 7 will be broken up into three sections. It's also another long, long chapter. And uh, again, we're focusing on change. Um, we can clearly see it in this chapter when Paul goes home to his house and he uh, experiences the difference and the contrast between home and away. So again, focus on change. Change in mood, change in personality, change in person, physical and otherwise. The irony involved in what should be comforting isn't comforting. And uh, the contrast between home and away. So here's chapter 7, first section, All Quiet on the Western Front, starting on page 132. They, t they have taken us farther back than usual to a field depot so that we can be reorganized. Our company needs more than a hundred reinforcements. In the meantime, when we are off duty, we loaf around. That means we, we get lazy and just hang out. After a couple days, Himmelstoss comes up to us. He has had the bounce knocked out of him since he has been in the trenches and wants to get on good terms with us. I am willing because I saw how he brought High Westhouse in when he was hit in the back. Besides, he's decent enough to treat us in the canteen when we are out of funds, so he gives, he gives him food for free. Only Jaden is still reserved and suspicious. But he is one over two when Himmelstoss tells us that he is taking the place of the sergeant cook who has gone on leave. As a proof, he produces on the spot two pounds of sugar for us and a half pound of butter specifically for Jaden. He even sees to it that we are detailed the next two, two or three days to the cookhouse for potato and turnip peeling. The grub he gives us there is real officer's fare. That means the officers get better food than the enlisted men, the men that are on the front line. Thus, momentarily, we have the two things a soldier needs for, for contentment, good food and rest. That's not much when, when one comes to think of it. A few years ago, we would have despised ourselves terribly, but now we were almost happy, almost. It is all a matter of habit, even the front line. Habit, and this is important, is the explanation of why we seem to forget things so quickly. Yesterday we were under fire, today we act the fool and go foraging through the countryside. Tomorrow we go up to the trenches again. We forget nothing really, but so long as we have to stay here in the field, the front line days, when they are past, sink down in us like a stone, a simile. They are too grievous for us to be able to react on them, uh, to reflect on them, at once. If we did that, we should have been destroyed long ago. I soon found out this much. Terror can be endured so long as it, so long as a man simply ducks, but it kills if a man thinks about it. So again, another coping mechanism is to, is to immediately forget what happened yesterday, to try to live only in the moment and to, and to think of memories of when you were a kid. Just as we turn into animals when we go up to the line, because that is the only thing which brings us through safely. That's a change. They turn into animals. So we turn into wags and loafers when we are resting. We can do nothing else. It is, it is a sheer necessity. We want to live at any price so we cannot burden ourselves with feelings, which, though they might be ornamental enough in peacetime, would be out of place here. In other words, They've even lost their feelings. That's another dramatic change. They have no feeling, no sadness, no real happiness, no anything. Again, it contributes to the change in indifference and stuff. <clears throat> Kemrich is dead. High Westhouse is dying. They will have a job with Hans Kramer's body at the Judgment Day, piecing it together after a direct hit. Martins has no legs anymore. Meyer is dead. Max is dead. Beyer is dead. Hammerling is dead. There are 120 wounded men lying somewhere or other. It is a damnable business, but what has it to do with us now? We live. If it were possible for us to save them, then it would be seen how much we cared. We would have a shot at it, though we went under ourselves, for we can be damned quixotic when we like. That means kind of mysterious. Fear we do not know much about. Terror of death? Yes, but that is a different matter. That is physical. 
So he's making a very strong distinction here between, you know, regular fear of regular stuff. The things that we used to be fearful of, we are no longer fearful of. The only fear we have is the absolute terror of death. And, he, and, and what he's saying here is that is physical, so that our bodies are responding to fight or flight. And that's it. So it's very, very animalistic. But our comrades are dead. We cannot help them. They have their rest. And who knows what is waiting for us. We will make ourselves comfortable and sleep and eat as much as we can, uh, as much as we can stuff in our bellies, and drink and smoke so that hours are not wasted. Life is short. The terror of the front sinks deep down when we turn our back upon it. We make grim, that means um, sad or foreshadowing of death, grim, coarse jests, jokes about it. When a man dies, when we say he has nipped off his turd, and so we speak of everything, that, that keeps us from, getting, from going mad. As long as we take it that way, we maintain our own resistance. In other words, if we joke about the dead people, then we're able to resist dying ourselves. So, you know, etc. But we do not forget. It's all rot that they put in the war news about the good humor of the troops, how they are arranging dances almost before they are out of the front line. We don't act like that because we are in a, in a good humor. We are in a good humor because otherwise we should go to pieces. Even so, we cannot hold out much longer. Our humor becomes more bitter every month. So even here in this commentary, it talks about the media. In all the newspapers, it says, you know, the troops are holding on. They, they, they're in good spirits. Uh, even though they're fighting, they're in good spirits. So the nationalism at home in the newspapers goes on. Well, what they really do is they laugh so that they won't fall apart. You know, and, and, and nobody in, in reality knows what they're going through unless they're actually there. And this I know. All these things that now, while we are still in the war, sink down in us like a stone. After the war shall waken again, and then shall begin the disentanglement of life and death. So when they're finally not in crisis when they go home, all of these things will wake back up again. They'll have time to think about them, and they'll destroy them yet again in their mental and their spiritual being. The days, the weeks, the years out here shall come, come back again, and our dead comrades shall then stand up again and march with us. Our heads shall be clear. We shall have a purpose, and so we shall march, our dead comrades beside us, the years at the front behind us. Against whom? Against whom? <coughs> when we get home, all of the ghosts of the dead people will be still fighting with us, fighting the battle of our minds and our brains at home. But who will we be fighting? We'll be fighting our memories, you know, our memories of death, and, 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 and who put us through this? etc. Some time ago, there was an army theater in these parts. Uh, not a theater like you think, a, a place where, um, <coughs> excuse me, where everybody went to hang out to have fun, sort of. Colored posters of the performances are still sticking uh, on our, uh, sticking on a hoarding. With wide eyes, Crop and I stand in front of it. We can hardly credit that such things still exist, a girl in a light summer dress with a red patent leather belt about her hips. She is standing with one hand on a railing and with the other she holds a straw hat. She wears white stockings and white shoes, fine buckle shoes with high heels. Behind her smiles the blue sea with white horses. At the side is a bright bay. She is a lovely girl with a delicate nose, red lips and slender legs, wonderfully clean and well cared for. She certainly bathes, uh, baths twice a day and never has any dirt under her nails. At most, perhaps, a bit of sand from the beach. So <coughs> they're in a town. There's a poster of a beautiful girl. Again, this is propaganda. You know, like the pictures that you guys put up on selfie, you, you almost always put up only the best pictures. Do they really look like who you really are? So they're showing their best selves, and the boys... The young men are allowed to dream about what the girl is. She's never dirty. There's, you know, she's always beautiful. She wears high heels. And this, you know, makes them long for, for, for the touch of, of another human being, a woman uh, who's clean, who's, who's pretty, who's loving, who's caring. Beside her stands a man in white trousers, a blue jacket, and a sailor's cap. 
happy, but he interests us much less. So there's, so there's a, a, a Navy guy there in crisp white pants, which it really isn't in war. It's another propaganda thing. The girl on the poster is a wonder to us. We have quite forgotten that there are such things, and even now we hardly believe our eyes. We have seen nothing like it for years, nothing like it for happiness, beauty, and joy. That is peacetime. That is as it should be. We feel excited. Just look, just look at those thin shoes, though. She couldn't march many miles in those, I say, and then begin to feel silly, for it's absurd to stand in front of this picture like this and think of nothing but marching. How old would she be, Crop asks. About 22 at the most, I hazard. Then she would be older than us. She's not, she's not more than 17, let me tell you. It gives us goose flesh. That would be good, Albert. What do you, what do you think? He nods. I have some white trousers at home, too. White trousers, say I. But a girl like that? We look askance. That means we look away from one another. You know, sort of kind of on the sly, out of the side of our eyes. We look askance at one another. There's not much of, to boast of here. Two ragged, stained, and dirty uniforms. It is hopeless to compete. In other words, they think of themselves, if they go home and find a girl like that, looking the way they look and feeling the way they feel, there's no way that they can get the girl. So they're already hurting themselves inside, you know, because the war has destroyed them even for that. Um, so we proceed to tear, the young, to tear the young man with the white trousers off the hoarding, taking care not to damage the girl. That is something, that is something toward it. So they take off the guy that they have to compare themselves to in the picture. They rip it off so that they only have the picture of the girl. We could go and get deloused anyway, Crop, Crop then suggests, which means we could go, you know, get the chemicals that take all the lice off our body so the girl might like us even better at that point. I'm not very enthusiastic um, because it doesn't do one's clothes any good and a man is lousy again inside two hours. So after, you know, it, it destroys the chemicals that they use to get rid of the lice, destroys your clothes, and then two hours later you still have lice again. Um, but when we have considered the picture once more, I declare myself willing. I go even farther. We might see if we could get a clean shirt as well. Socks might be better, says Albert, not without reason. Yes, socks too, perhaps. Let's go and explore a bit. Then Lear and Jaden stroll up. They look at the poster and immediately the conversation becomes smutty. That means, um, you know, talking about sex. And stuff. Lear was the first of our class to have intercourse, and he gave stirring details of it. After his fashion, he enjoys himself over the picture, and Jaden supports him nobly. It does not distress us exactly. Who isn't smutty is no soldier. It merely does not suit us at the moment, so we edge away and march off to the delousing station with the same feeling as if we were, as if it were a swell gentleman's outfitter. So, you know, they pretend that they're going to go to the place to get rid of all the lice and, and, and instead be fitted with beautiful suits and things like that. So their minds are there. So they have the, the women. And don't forget, Lear's name is also uh, a symbolic name because to leer at somebody means to look at somebody sexually in a creepy kind of way. It means creepy go, mm, you know, that type of thing. Men, how they look at women as they pass by. So this guy's name is very symbolic because he's, he's all about the women as you'll soon see. The houses in which we are billeted lie near the canal. On the other side of the canal, there are ponds flanked with poplars. On the other side of the canal, there are women, too. The houses on our side have been abandoned. On the other side, though, one occasionally sees inhabitants. In the evening, we go swimming. Three women come strolling along the bank. They walk slowly and don't look away although we have no bathing suits. Lear calls out to them. They laugh and stop to watch us. We fling remarks at them in broken French, anything that comes into our heads, hastily and all jumbled together, anything to detain them. They are not specially wonderful pieces, but then where are such to be had about here? So these are enemy women. They're French women, but they're women. So the men want, so the men want to hang with them. There is one slim little brunette. Her teeth gleam when she laughs. That means they shine. 
She has quick movements and her dress swims loosely around her legs. Although the water is cold, we are very jovial, that means happy and joking, and do our best to interest them so that they will stay. We try to make jokes and they answer with things we cannot understand. We laugh and beckon, that means we tell them, come here, come here. Jaden is more crafty. He runs into the house, gets a loaf of army bread and holds it up. That produces a great effect. They nod and beckon us to come over to them. But we don't dare do that. It is forbidden to cross to the opposite bank. There are sentries, that means guards, on all the bridges. It's impossible without a pass. So we indicate that they should come over to us, but they shake their heads and point to the bridge. They are not allowed to pass either. They turn back and walk slowly down the canal, keeping along the towpath all, all the way. We accompany them swimming. So they're swimming in the water, following the girls who are walking on the edge. After a few hundred yards, they turn off and point to a house that stands a little distance among the trees and shrubbery. Lear asks if they live there. They laugh. Sure, that's their house. We call out to them that we'd like to come sometime when the guards cannot see us at night, tonight. They raise their hands, put them together, rest their faces on them, and shut their eyes. They understand. The slim brunette does a two-step. That's a dance. The blonde tw girl twitters. Bread, good. Eagerly, we assure them that we will bring some with us, and other tasty bits, too. We roll our eyes and try to explain with our hands. Lear nearly drowns trying to demonstrate a sausage. That's kind of an inside joke. Look for the irony in that. If it were necessary, we would promise them a whole quartermaster's store. They go off and frequently turn and look back. We climb out on the bank on our side of the canal and watch to see whether they go into the house, for they might easily have been lying. Then we swim back. No one can cross the bridge without leave, so we will simply have to swim overnight, over tonight. We are full of excitement. We cannot last out without a drink, so we go to the canteen where there is beer and a kind of punch. We drink punch and tell, and tell one another lying tales of our experiences. Each man gladly believes the other man's story, only waiting impatiently till he can cap it with a taller one. Our hands are fidgety. We smoke countless cigarettes until Crop says we might as well take them a few cigarettes too. So we put some inside our caps to keep them. The sky turns apple green. There are four of us, but only three can go. We must shake off Jaden. So ply him with rum and punch until he rocks. As it turns dark, we go to our billets. Jaden in the center. We are glowing and full of lust for adventure. The little brunette is mine. We have settled all that. Jaden drops on his sack of straw and snores. Once he wakes up and grins so craftily that we have alarmed that we are alarmed and begin to think he is cheating, and that we have given him the punch to no purpose, then he drops back again and sleeps on. We each get hold of a whole army loaf and wrap it up in newspaper, the cigarettes we put in two, as well as three good rations of liver sausage that were issued to us this evening. That makes a decent present. We stow the things carefully in our boots. We have to take them to protect our feet against treading on wire and broken glass on the other on the other bank. As we must swim for it, we can take no other clothes, but it is not far and quite dark. We make off with our boots in our hands. Swiftly, we swift into, we slip into the water, lie on our backs and swim, holding the boots with their contents up over our heads. We climb out carefully on the opposite bank, take out the packages and put on our boots. We put the things under our arms and so, all wet and naked, clothed only in our boots, we break into a trot. We find the house at once. It lies among the trees. Lear trips over a root and skins his elbows. No matter, he says gaily. The windows are shuttered. We slip round the house and try to peer through the cracks. Then we grow impatient. Suddenly, Crop hesitates. What if there's a major with them? Then we just clear off, grins, grins Lear. He can try to read our regimental tumblers, uh, our regimental numbers here, and smacks his behind. So there's humor again. The door of the courtyard stands open. Our boots made a great clatter. The house door opens. A chink of light shines through, and a woman cries out in a scared voice. Shh, shh, comrade, bon ami. Good French, we say, and show our packages protestingly. The other two are now on the scene. The door opens and the light floods over us. They recognize us and all three burst into laughter at our appearance. 
They rock and, away, and sway in the doorway. They laugh so much. How supple their movements are. Un moment. They disappear and throw us bits of clothing which we gladly wrap around ourselves. Then we are allowed in. A small lamp burns in their room, which is warm and smells a little of perfume. We unwrap our parcels and hand them over to the women. Their eyes shine. It is obvious that they are hungry. They used to do that years ago with lamps. They used to put drops of perfume on a light bulb, and every time you turn on the light bulb, when it heats up, the room would smell like the perfume, which is something you can still do, but you have to be careful because sometimes it burns and busts the light bulb if you're not careful. There we all become rather embarrassed. Lear makes the gestures of eating, and then they come to life again and bring out plates and knives and fall to on the food. And they hold up every slice of livered sausage and admire it before they eat it, and we sit proudly by. They overwhelm us with their chatter. We understand very little of it, but we listen, and the words sound friendly. No doubt we all look very young. The little brunette strokes my hair and says what all French women say, La guerre, grand malheur, pauvre garçon. La guerre means the war. Grand malheur, I'm not sure, but it means big badness, mal meaning badness, maybe. And then pauvre garçon means poor men, you poor men. I hold her arm tightly and press my lips into the palm of her hand. Her fingers close round my face. Close above me are her bewildering eyes, the soft brown of her skin and her red lips. Her mouth speaks words I do not understand. Nor do I fully understand her eyes. They seem to say more than we anticipated when we came here. There are other rooms adjoining. In passing, I see Lear. He has made a great hit with the blonde. He is an old hand at the game, but I, I am lost in remoteness, in weakness, and in passion, to which I yield myself trustingly. My desires are strangely compounded of yearning and misery. Contrast. He yearns for it, but he's miserable. I feel giddy. There is nothing here that, that a man can hold on to. We have left our boots at the door. They have given us slippers instead. And now nothing remains to recall for me the assurance and self-confidence of the soldier. No rifle, no belt, no tunic, no cap. I let myself drop into the unknown, come what may. Yet in spite of all, I feel somewhat afraid because his only persona, the only person he is and has ever become is a soldier. So without his clothes and his rifle and all of those things, he doesn't know who he is, even in the presence of a woman, even if it's something he desired. He doesn't know what to do. He doesn't know who he is. He's bewildered. He's scared. He's alone. He's vulnerable. And so this change, this, this, this return to humanity is, is really very unusual. The little brunette con uh, contracts her brows when she is thinking, but when she talks, they are still. And often sound does not quite become a word, but suffocates or floats away over me, half finished, an arc, a pathway. Comment. All of those are metaphors, by the way. What have I known of it? What, what do I know of it? Words of this foreign tongue that I hardly understand, they caress me to a quietness in which the room grows dim and dissolves in the half-light. Only the face above me lives and is clear. How various is a face, but an hour ago it was strange, and it is now touched with a tenderness that comes, not from it, but from but out of the night. The world and the blood, all these things seem to shine in it together. The objects in the room are touched by it and transformed. They become isolated, and I feel almost awed at the sight of my clear skin when the light of the lamp falls upon it and the cool brown hand passes over it. He doesn't even recognize himself anymore, physically. How different this is from the conditions in the soldier's brothel. A brothel is a whorehouse a place where you go get prostitutes, to which we are allowed to go and where we have to wait in long queues, long lines. I wish I never thought of them, but desire turns my mind to them involuntary, involuntarily, and I am afraid for it. It might be impossible ever to be free of them again. So he's, again, the author is making a distinction between going to a whorehouse and seeing real women who have real emotions who aren't there for the express pur purpose of servicing them sexually. So these are real 
real women with feelings and thoughts and everything else. And he has become so changed that he doesn't know how to handle a woman anymore, a real woman, not, not a whore, not somebody who gets paid to have sex with you so that it becomes, you know, when you, when you pay to have sex, it becomes something that's very indifferent. You, you know, you don't think about feelings. You don't think about the other person. You just commit an act and that's it. No, nothing else. But then I feel the lips of the little brunette and press myself against them. My eyes close. I want it all to fall from me, war and terror and grossness, in order to awaken young and happy. <coughs> I think of the picture of the girl on the poster and for a moment believe that my life depends on winning her. And if I press ever deeper into the arms that embrace me, perhaps a miracle may happen. So after a time, we find ourselves reassembled again. Lear is in high spirits. We pull on our boots and take our leave warmly. The night air cools our hot bodies. The rustling poplars loom large in the darkness. The moon floats in the heavens and in the waters of the canal. We do not run. We walk beside one another with long strides. That was worth a ration loaf, says Lear. I cannot trust myself to speak. I am not in the least happy. One wants to wonder why he isn't happy. Think about those reasons. Then we hear footsteps and dodge behind a shrub. The steps come nearer, close by us. We see a naked soldier in boots, just like ourselves. He has a package under his arm and gallops onward. It is Jaden in full force. He has disappeared already. We laugh. In the morning, he will curse us. Unobserved, we arrive again with our sacks of straw. <coughs> Sorry. I am called to the orderly room. The company commander gives me a leave pass and a travel pass and wishes me a good journey. I look to see how much I, a leave I have got. That means how much money he has been paid to be there. Or how many days, I'm sorry, how many days he has to be there. I look to see how much leave I have got. 17 days, 14 days leave and three days for traveling. It is not enough. And I ask whether I cannot have five days for traveling. Burtnick points out, uh, to, points to my pass. There I see that I'm not to return to the front immediately. After my leave, I have to report for a course in training to a camp on the moors. <clears throat> the others envy me. Cat gives me good advice and tells me, I ought to try to get a, whor uh, to get a, a base job. If you're smart enough, you'll hang on to it. I would rather not have gone for another eight days. We are to stay here that much longer, and it is good here. Naturally, I have to stand the other's drinks at the canteen. That means I have to buy the other's drinks. We are all a little bit drunk. I become gloomy. I will be away for six weeks. That is lucky, of course. But what may happen before I get back? Shall I meet all these fellows again? Already Hay and Kemmerich have gone. Who will be next? So he's wondering, if he's gone for six weeks, who's going to die while he's gone? As we drink, I look at each of them in turn. Albert sits beside me and smokes. He is cheerful. We have always been together. Opposite, opposite squats, cat, with his drooping shoulders, his broad thumb and calm voice. Mueller with the project, uh, projecting teeth and booming laugh. Jaden with his mousy eyes. Lear, who has grown a full beard and looks at least 40. <coughs> <clears throat> so Paul is taking a good long look at his friends so that if he never sees them again, he'll remember what they look like and who they are as people. Over us hangs a dense cloud of smoke. Where would a soldier be without tobacco? The canteen in his refuge and beer is far more than a drink. It is a token that a man can move his limbs and stretch in safety. We do it ceremonially. We stretch our legs out in front of us and spit deliberately. That is the only way. How it all rises up before a man when he is going away the next morning. At night, we go again to the other side of the, the canal. I am almost afraid to tell the little brunette that I am going away, and when I return, return, we will be far from here. We will never see one another again. But she merely nods and takes no special notice. At first, I am at a loss to understand, then it suddenly dawns on me. Yes, Lear is right. If I were going up to the front... Then she would have called me again, poor garçon. But merely going on leave, she does not want to hear about that. That is not nearly as interesting. May she go to the devil with her chattering talk. 
A man dreams of a miracle and wakes up to loaves of bread. And so the girl, like many people today, is only interested in, in, in the funny stories of war or the, you know, all of that excitement. She's not interested in the fact that he's going home on leave. So really what he discovers here, what really hits home for him, is that she really doesn't care about him that much. All she cares about is the story of the war. She doesn't care about him as a human being. So that's a huge disappointment. Um, it's, like, it's like a guy who's got a nice car finding out that the girl he really loves doesn't love him but only loves the car. Next morning after I have been deloused, I go to the railhead. Albert and Kat come with me. At the halt, we learn that it will be a couple of hours yet before the train leaves. The other two have to go back to duty. We take leave of one another. Good luck, Kat. Good luck, Albert. They go off and wave once or twice. Their figures dwindle. I know their every step and movement. I would recognize them at a distance. Then they disappear. That could be another metaphor. Then they disappear. Are they disappearing to die? Are they disappearing... To go away. It's, a, it's an interesting image as they walk away and he recognizes them. He's become closer to them than he is to his own life at home. I sit down on my pack and wait. Suddenly, I become filled with a consuming impatience to be gone. So that's the end of the first section of chapter seven. Um, they've met some women. They've made some changes. Many people are dead. And now Paul anticipates going home. They've given him leave for two weeks to go back to his house uh, and some travel time. And unfortunately, um, you know, he, he, he doesn't know what to think about it. So keep in mind all the irony that's going on, the change that's happened, the moods that have been created um, in the characterization, and any bit of contrast. So there's a ton of all of those things. Contrast between men and women, contrast between French and German, Contrast between, you know, one side of the bank and the other side of the bank uh, uh, on the water. Um, contrast in food, contrast in lifestyle, you know, and all of those things being ironic. So next time we'll meet again for Chapter 7, uh, Part 2.